of Ephesians, still in chapter 3. I'll begin by reading verse 7 and I'll go down to verse 13. Ephesians chapter 3, beginning in verse 7. Whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God, given unto me by the effectual working of his power, unto me who am less than the least of all saints is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ, to the intent that now into the principalities and powers and heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God, according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. Wherefore, I desire that ye faint not at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. May we look to our Lord now in a word of prayer. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you again for thy love to us, mercy and grace and watch care over us. I thank thee, our Father, for allowing us this privilege, again, as it's already been prayed and mentioned, to come into the house of the Lord for our dear, precious saints of God. And Father, I pray that you would just open up our hearts, ears, and mind to be open and receptive to thy word. Heavenly Father, that you would give me wisdom and liberty to present thy word in truth and in love. And if there are any here today that are lost, any here today that know you not as Savior, in the full pardon and forgiveness of their sin, may you, Lord, reveal yourself unto them today, and that you would draw them and cause them to repent of their sins. Oh, how glorious that would be. I ask, Father, that you would be with all of our sister churches, and ask that you bless in the services. I ask, Father, that you would be with all the upcoming meetings that we have mentioned that we know about and probably many more that we don't know about our own um, VBS that is coming and then our fellowship meeting and many fellowship meetings and conferences before that I ask father that you would lead us and guide us help us to do all things that are right and pleasing in thy sight we ask for the forgiveness of our sins and these things we ask in Jesus name Amen. Amen. thank you may be seated all right so we left off last week right it wasn't really that I counted that as a whole freestanding message uh, as we talked about Paul the preacher. We've talked about Paul already as a pioneer and the message that he brought. I will review a little bit of that this afternoon. But today I want to look at Paul as the missionary, as this preacher, yes, that has been called of God. So we'll review verse 7 a little bit. But this God called missionary and this mystery of the gospel that he is bringing unto the Gentiles. And so we'll, we'll dive into these verses a little bit more. Really, they're, they're further going into the explanation of what we see here, or what Paul has already told us. And so, you know, and then we get into what we talked about, that prayer. That's what will be next week, the Lord willing, in verse 14. But there are some gorgeous, again, and beautiful verses that uh, just, just lend to some preaching and some... Uh, exposition of. And so, again, as we go through this, I have a lot of scripture that I'm going to compare with the scripture that is already here. So, uh, you know, that'd be good, right? We had a big meal. It's a hot afternoon. And uh, we'll keep you on your toes a little bit and have you turning through the Bible. So, again, Ephesians chapter 3, just a glorious chapter thus far. Made it uh, all the way through these uh, seven verses. And we'll, we'll start with verse 7, though, again. But it's given us some insight into the man that we know as Paul. Right? Verse 1 told us, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles. We learned that while Paul, yes, was imprisoned of the Roman soldiers and the Roman guard, that first and foremost, he is a prisoner of Jesus Christ. That he is, that he is a servant of Jesus Christ, which again we will bring out a little bit later. He is truly a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then in verse 2 through 6, Paul tells us that he is a pioneer. That is, he was given the revelation of the truth that was hidden from all folks until now. Even as we read it again today. Um, 
you know, verse 9, and to make men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. We learned what the, in the course of the last two weeks what that great mystery was, and that is that Jews and Gentiles alike can be saved by the grace of Almighty God, and Jews and Gentiles alike will be part of the family of God. Again, this coming from Paul, a very outlandish type message, but God gave him the ability and the wisdom and the strength to preach it, but the Jews didn't want to hear it, and the Gentiles didn't want to believe it, right? If that makes sense. The Jews were like, nah, -uh, no way. These Gentiles are not like us. They're not part of us. We don't want anything to do with them. And the Gentiles are like, uh, uh no way. Sounds too good. The Jews are never going to accept us. But I'll tell you what, through Jesus Christ, Jews and Gentiles, part of the family of God, by the blood of Christ, through the salvation that is offered by the grace of God, again, in and through the person of Jesus Christ. It is Jesus Christ who is the great uh, um, oh I had the words that I wanted in my mouth. It is the Lord Jesus Christ who is the, is the one that is able to uh, put an end to the, uh, to the separations and all of those different things. It is through the blood of Christ that we have union one with another. I have fellowship with you all. I am a brother and sister to those of you that are here today. Whether you want to claim me as part of the family or not, guess what? I am part of your family. <laughs> You're, that's right. It's okay. We are brothers and sisters together. And Christ our Lord has given us that blessed union. So that great mystery that was hid for all these generations, God gave to Paul. What a message. And we're going to expound upon that a little bit today as Paul the missionary. Again, the mystery that the Lord Jesus Christ all people, regardless of their race, their heritage, or anything else that makes no difference. You see, Paul goes on to continue what he already laid down in Ephesians 2, 8-10. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. It is the blessed grace of God, again, covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. Praise God. Now we ended last week again before uh, we broke for our meeting in the call of this great apostle as a preacher. So let's look into it a little bit deeper now. He was a preaching missionary. And I just, reti I just titled this one Paul the Missionary. Let me start again in verse 7 here. And as we go through this, be ready to turn. Here we go. Verse 7 again. Whereof I was made a minister according to to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of His power. You see, Paul had a divine appointment as a missionary. That he was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God. Given unto me by the effectual working of His power. Paul, of himself, did not choose this path of life. In fact, Paul was a man of position and power before the Lord saved him. When God saved Paul, He also called him to carry the Gospel. Turn over, if you would, to the book of Acts chapter 9. I'm going to give you a little bit more about Paul's life later and how he persecuted the church. It's just going to come out and make a little bit more sense in the later verses. But I want to read this to you here in Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 6. Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 6. Paul's amazing blinding on the road to Damascus and God's calling Paul. Paul's amazing conversion here. Well, it begins in Acts chapter 9, verse 1 here, under his old name. He was Saul. Saul of Tarsus. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went into the high priest. Now again, I'm going to expound this out a little bit further, but just understand what you just read. Paul was breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples. The disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul, or Saul at this time, was not a friend of the disciples. He wasn't a friend of God. He was at enmity against God like all sinners are before the Lord Jesus Christ saves us. All right. And desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he 
found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound into Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? So we begin here again with this calling of God from Saul of Tarsus. And here is Saul. He's bringing these disciples and these, you know, what we'll call Christians bound to him in Jerusalem. It was because he wanted them beheaded and killed and murdered and all kinds of things that Paul wanted. Paul is on his way to Damascus and he gets what I'll just call blinded by the light of God. <laughs> And I'll tell you what, when God saved me, it was like the light blinded me too. But we see here that this light literally was blinding Paul on his way to Damascus. And God speaks to Paul and he says, you know, Saul, Saul why persecutest thou me? A lot of people don't like to think that they are persecuting God when they are, you know, uh, killing other people and all these things. But God says this is a direct offense to him. And Paul's going to have to give an answer to this. Verse 5, and he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was there, or and, and I'm sorry, and he was three days without sight, and neither did eat nor drink. Three days he was without sight from this. And in this, we see not only God save him, God's called him to be this great missionary. Understand, beloved, again, it was not Paul's education. It wasn't his power in his secular life and secular world or any other thing that made him a preacher of the gospel. It was all by the sovereign will of God. And I'm going to turn to these verses over here in Romans. And, and I use these verses quite frequently for other things. I turn to Romans 8, over here to verse 28 and 29, a lot of times when I'm talking about what's going on in our life. I talk about a lot of times when there is trials and tribulation, when, when things might not be going according to how we plan. We turn to Romans 8, 28, and as we should, it's a glorious verse, right? And oftentimes when I preach this verse, you know, you know, if you're talking to somebody in a hard time, they just say that, you know, we go to this verse just as a clutch and that, you know, we don't really believe it all. Let me tell you something. I really believe Romans 8, 28. Amen. I mean, I know that all things work together good. I don't turn here very often when I talk about following the will of God in our life. Because I'm going to tell you that it's not always easy. And so I think even in this context, we need to be reminded in Romans 8, 28, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. For whom He did foreknow, He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. Have you been called of God? Well, you can know that your life, that it's all going to work together for good. It is. And praise God for that. Take you over there to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 11. It says here, But the manifestation of the Spirit, sorry, but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. For to one is given by the Spirit of or the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit. To another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit. To another the working of miracles. To another prophecy. To another discerning of Spirit. To another diverse kinds of tongues. To another the interpretation of tongues. But all these work at that one and the self-same Spirit divided to every man servilely as he will. In other words, God blesses with different gifts to different folk. And, and Paul, Paul did not see himself as worthy of this calling. 
and such as it should be with the way of all, of all of God's called men. That we are to be a servant to Jesus Christ our Lord and to the people. Again, first we are to be a servant to Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, and this goes for all of God's children to be a servant of Christ, not just the preachers. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God. You see, I have been bought with a price. You have been bought with a price. All of God's children are to glorify God with our body. I have the wonderful privilege of proclaiming the message or messages week after week, but I have absolutely the same responsibility to glorify God when I leave these doors as you do. I, and I fail at it. That's not, I'm not bragging in that. I'm not boasting in that. I fail at it. I fail at it at home. I fail at it at work. I fail at it here. But I need to be mindful of the calling. I need to be mindful of the fact, as we all do, that we have been bought with this price to glorify God. And what a blessed privilege it is to be a servant of Jesus Christ, our Lord. <laughs> what an awesome, wonderful thing it is. I, I, you know, I sit here and I wonder, how do people even get along in this world without knowing God? And I don't know. They have periods of joy and periods of happiness, but they don't have that true happiness. They seek to find happiness in other things. So I was talking about with one of the members, right? I mean, no matter what sin it is, whether it's a sin of sodomy, they're trying to seek to fill that void. Whether it's a, the sin of drunkenness or the, the sin of, uh, of lust or the sin of, uh, you know, whatever, name a hundred of them. But to be a servant of Christ and to know that God is using us to glorify Him. Oh, what a privilege. Well then, not only that, but we as God's children are also have the privilege of serving one another. In Galatians 5, right? You know it. In Galatians 5, verses 9 and 10. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. As we have, therefore, opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are the household of faith. Especially unto them who are the household of faith. So we have an opportunity to serve one another. Verse 13, same chapter, For neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law, but desire to have you circumcised, that they may glorify or glory in your flesh. But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I into the world. Serve. It, it's, it's an honor to be able to serve one another. And then when we as a whole entire body of Christ have opportunity to help brothers and sisters and missionaries, it is our way of glorifying Christ. Isn't that great? Do you know? Isn't that, isn't that wonderful? So here's, here's Paul with this amazing message that he has been given, and there's an appointment from God to go out and preach. And in that, he's glorifying God. Preaching these wonderful truths. Now, let's, let's read verse 8 again, right? Back in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 8. Let's not be stuck on verse 7 forever. I spent more time there than I thought I would. Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles, the unsearchable riches of Christ. Preaching the wonderful truths of the Lord Jesus Christ. Considering, folks, where Paul came from. Remember, I read to you already Acts chapter 9, verses 1 and 2, of the threatenings and the slaughterings that he was doing to the disciples. Wanting these folks being bound from and brought to him. He did everything in his power to destroy Christians. Look at the way it says it in Acts chapter 8 and verse 3. This is who Paul was, folks. This is who Paul was. In Acts chapter 8 and verse 3. 
the way it describes it here. And Saul, as for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women, committing them to prison. He made havoc. That word havoc, confusion, chaos, clutter, havoc, discord, all of those things. And that's who Saul was until we get past that verse 9, or Acts 9, 1 and 2, where God blinded him and converted him. Let me tell you, folks, God is able to save. And we are not to judge who God saves and who God uses. Amen. I'm sure that these folks in Ephesus, now again, the Gentiles, a little resistant to this message that they were going to be one with the Jews, and the Jews were like, uh-uh. Right? But here's this guy who had a reputation. Right? And, and praise God, he changed the name. He changed his name from Saul of Tarsus to the great apostle Paul. Well, I don't know that God put all of those. He changed it from Saul to Paul. That I know. Who we now know as the great apostle. What would you do? I'm talking about from the flesh. Right? Now, I know, humanly speaking, what we would do, what we would say. Right? But, fleshly wise, if we knew that someone was wreaking havoc in, let's just say, one of our sister churches, wreaking havoc and uh, even murdering even murdering some of our brothers and sisters people that we know people that we love people that are in our sister churches we find out that they were lost the entire time and that God has saved them and called them to come here and preach to us how would we feel? it would probably be a little uneasy at first Right? Now, let's just be honest. In the flesh, it'd be a little uneasy at first. And so here's Paul, this great missionary, who, you know, we can turn through and we can see all of Paul's amazing missionary journeys and all of these things in this map somewhere, and who went all over the place preaching and teaching the gospel and has give, been given this mystery that, you know, Moses and Abraham and none of those guys knew and anything like that. I know that they're here. I know that they are. I've seen it. Now I just got to find it. It's more of like a. Well, I don't want to say pride thing, because pride is not a good thing. Here, here we go. It's going to be here. Here we are. Paul's missionary journeys. Here's this great missionary who is now currently speaking to those here in Ephesus, who was Saul of Tarsus, persecutor to Christians. How would we react to that? I mean, we know God blessed his ministry. We can, we can clearly see that. Right? How would we react? This one that was sent out. Praise God, God is able to make a change. Amen. We're not to judge. And we can examine fruit. <laughs> and we can, uh, we, can, we can put some you know, trials and tests in that way, but God makes the change. After all, 1 Timothy chapter 1. Here's what Paul says. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 11 through 17. According to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust, and I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in my unbelief. Again, I just want to reiterate, we're comparing a lot of Scripture with Scripture here. This is what Paul has already said and, and what we know of Paul from the book of Acts. And he's kind of given that stand and that little bit to the, the, the church there in Ephesus. And he's reminding Timothy about these things as well. And he's telling them about the glorious gospel. You know, I haven't done this word search, and I probably should. Alan, you like word searches. Now, I want to know how many times Paul used the word gospel in his preaching. Amen? I mean, I, I, mean, I just read it. It's, it's been three times already this afternoon. The glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust, Paul says. Again, this blasphemer, this persecutor, 
And he says in verse 14, And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. Now he says, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Paul says, I'm the worst. I think many of us feel that way. And he says it to the church here at Ephesus as well, just a little bit differently. And he says in verse 8, as I read, unto me who am less than the least of all the saints. I'm the less of the least. I'm the worst of the worst. I'm lower than the least. God did amazing things to Paul. And Paul wanted people to know that it was the grace of God. Paul desired people to see that. So if you're here and serving the Lord, I believe we can just slightly imagine how Paul must have felt. Well then, secondly, I want to show you Paul's announcement of his missionary preaching here. It says unto me again, who am less than the least of all the saints, is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. The unsearchable riches of Christ. Paul was a preacher again sent to preach to the Gentiles. And he preached these unsearchable riches of Christ. The word unsearchable means unfathomable. Found fathom. Oh, that's a fun word to say. I've seen movies where an actor is trying to say that word and he messed it up like six or seven times. So I'm not going to try to say it again. It is without fathom. <laughs> The unsearchable riches of Christ. That is depths that cannot be reached when preaching about the glory of God. Paul is declaring a message to this church that no human being can fully comprehend how deep the Father's love for us. How vast beyond all measure. Beloved, it is the unsearchable riches of Christ. That's what this missionary was preaching. He went out to declare, as we read, the glorious gospel. I can preach my entire life and still never scratch the surface of these amazing scriptures. Here's just, just literally four of them, of these unsearchable riches. Literally just four of them. We are loved by God. We who are God's children are loved by God. It goes on to say in Jeremiah 31.3 that He loves us with an everlasting love. A love that lasts forever. And then I quoted this morning John 3.16 For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believed in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. He loves us with an everlasting love. And He has given us an everlasting life, a life that lasts forever. How deep the Father's love for us. That is an unsearchable richness of Christ. Now we talked about the love of God a lot in the Ephesian messages already. You want to talk about another unsearchable rich of Christ, riches of Christ. How about that we are His chosen people. He loved us. And He chose us, right? According as He hath chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. He included me. Right? Before the world began. Certainly along with all of that, the unsearchable riches of Christ, that we are saved by the blood of His Son. Saved by that amazing grace. 1 Peter chapter 1. My second, I have so many favorites. It would be funny for you to do another word study of how many times I say my favorite verses. Just I get excited about the Word of God. I hope you do too. 1 Peter, well that kind of sounds like Buddy Davis. It's designed to do what it does do. Yeah. <laughs> hope you do too. Do you? Okay, I'm back. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19. It says, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, 
but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. That's an unsearchable richness of Christ. We are not redeemed with the corruptible things of this world. We were redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Paul says again, and he is the less than the least of all the saints that he should preach among the Gentiles these unsearchable riches of Christ. I mean, we all feel that way. And I have one more. And I was going to say that we are eternally saved. That we are eternally saved. Everlasting life. Saved for all eternity. That is an unsearchable richness of Christ as well. Paul says, I am not deserving to preach any of this to you. I mean, that's the context of what he is saying. As a missionary, he is saying that it is all about the grace of God that changed me. I didn't deserve any of this. And he preached this message to him. So many more of the depths of the riches of Christ. We have so much to praise and thank the Lord for. These riches of His grace. What we see here in verse 9, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world have been hid in God, who created all things by Christ Jesus. How glorious is this? Now, obviously, we know enough about Paul that Paul knew that it wasn't his responsibility to make men believe. But Paul wanted to go and preach to as many people as he could. May that be our desire today. After all, we are bought with a price. What To do what with? To glorify God with our bodies. To be a servant of Christ and then to serve others. Again, talking about that mystery that was hidden from the beginning of the world. That had been hidden in God. Who created all things by Jesus Christ. It's another verse that I like to use. And I don't want to get too far off course here. But, you know, again, remember we say at the beginning it says, God says in, in the book of Genesis, let us make man in our own, own image. You see, Christ wasn't created. Christ is God. And this is another verse that just reiterates that and shows that. In the book of Colossians, a verse that we often go to when talking about this. In Colossians. Oh, ha! I was like, that is not the right verse. I was still in Ephesians. Good for me. I turned back to Ephesians. Not bad. Not bad, not bad. All right. I'm almost there. Don't you worry about me. I got it. In verse 18, we use this often, right? Or 16. For by Him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by Him and for Him. Christ was there at the beginning. And we see this again in Ephesians chapter 3. We see it again. Who hath hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. To the intent, verse 10, that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. So God saved Paul. God called Paul. And Paul acknowledged that it was all from God. And Paul didn't keep quiet about it. That's what I see here. Paul went out and he preached this mystery that had been hidden. He preached, as we read in 2 Timothy, or 1 Timothy, excuse me, the glorious gospel according to the manifold wisdom of God according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord this goes back to talking about you know the will of God this goes back to talking about how God called Paul and that he was serving under God to that eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord the eternal purpose you all know most of my testimony, I wasn't raised in church. I wasn't raised around God's people. I wasn't raised around Baptists. I didn't know the eternal purpose that God has for me. I still don't know. All I know is that I'm a saved child of God who has been called to preach His Word. You never would have thought that of Saul. You never would have thought that this guy that wreaked havoc on the church, that in the eternal purpose of God, would come to be again Paul. 
the missionary great apostle. Never underestimate God. He is awesome. Moses didn't think he'd be able to go before Pharaoh. He had Aaron speaking for, for him for a while, but then Moses was able to speak himself. Right? God took a ruddy fellow like David, caused him to defeat Goliath. God took a rebellious man named Jonah, got him over to Nineveh, caused the city to repent. You see, God is able. Never underestimate Almighty God and His eternal purpose. God's divine purposes. First John chapter one, or yeah, First John chapter three and verse eight. All, all of these things are God's divine purposes, of course. First uh, John chapter three and verse eight. He that committed the sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that He might destroy the works of the devil. That we are part of this eternal purpose, which He purposed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. That He purposed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Well, then, finally, we have Paul's acknowledgement as a preacher, as a missionary. Verses 12 and 13. In whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of Him. Wherefore I desire that you faint not at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. Paul's words in these few verses serve to remind us once again that God is in control. And that it is because of our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ that we can have this boldness. In whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of Him. Certainly, let me turn you over to the book of Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 16. Hebrews 4 and verse 16. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And then we can be bold. Bold as a lion, right? But harmless as dove. That we can go out a zealous people to good works, remembering that this is all according to the eternal purpose of God, which He purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's how we have the boldness, is through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's how Paul was able to stand in front of these Jews and Gentiles and tell them of the mystery. That's how Ezekiel was able to stand in front of the people that he ministered to, his own countrymen. And tell them about their idols and their sin because of Jesus Christ. Wherefore I desire that you faint not of my tribulations for you, which is your glory. Paul says, don't worry about what I'm going through. And Paul never told him, you don't have to take care of me, you don't need to look out for me and all that stuff. No, he didn't expect any of those things. It was always a blessing to Paul when churches provided for Paul. It was always a blessing to Paul when churches gave to Paul. But he didn't want him to get all the way hung up in that. He says, I'm doing it for your glory. Don't faint at it, but keep on going. So Paul, the missionary, bring in the message of the glorious gospel. Next week, we see how Paul prays for these saints here in Ephesus. I thank you for your attention to the Word of God, and may God use the message. Bless our hearts. Let's stand together and we'll be dismissed in a word of prayer.